Hi, I'm Dr. Joseph Camo, an Associate Professor of Sociology at Georgia Southwestern State University, and today I'm going to talk to you about groups and group dynamics. Now to start with, we need to define what is a group. We use the word group in conversation to describe a lot of different collections of people. Sociologists often actually use very specific terms, aggregate, category, and then group. So an aggregate is a collection of people who happen to be in the same space at a particular time. Think about if you go to the motor vehicle department to get your driver's license or you're at the grocery store, we would see that collection of people in that space and we might conversationally say, hey, look at that group over there. But in the context of these terms, that is an aggregate. It's people in a space that have no real connection other than they happen to be in the same space at the same time. Now category are people who have a particular trait in common. Think about freshmen or all people who wear glasses or people who are tall or short. That is a category, people who are in a particular category based on some quality or trait that they possess. Again, that's a kind of collection of people that sometimes they would call a group, the group of people who are tall or the group of freshmen on campus. But with the language we're using here, we would call that a category. Finally, sociologists reserve the term group for a collection of people who see themselves as connected in some meaningful way. Think about your friendship group or your family or your book club or your soccer team. These are people who see themselves as part of some collection, some whole that is in itself meaningful. There are meaningful relationships, connections. They see themselves as part of this thing, part of a family, part of a friendship group. That is what we call groups. Now again, aggregates, categories, and groups are all conversationally referred to as groups. But sociologists like to use specific language so we can be more precise in what we're talking about. Now groups can also be divided up in different ways. We also talk about what we call primary groups and secondary groups. Primary groups are those groups that are more closely connected to us. Think about family, friends, the people we're close to. Secondary groups are groups that we're part of, but we don't have such a strong connection to them. Maybe it's people you're in a class with, maybe it's people you work with. It's a larger group typically that you're not as immediately connected to. We also look at the different needs met by these groups. Primary groups tend to meet more what we might call socio-emotional needs. Esteem needs, needs to have people who you feel comfortable with, you feel loved by, you feel connected to. Primary groups often fill those needs for connection. Secondary groups often meet more material needs. Needs to have a space where you can accomplish goals. Think about the classroom you go to, uh, that is part of your goal to get your education, the university or the school you're attending. The groups, those secondary groups you're part of there are part of an institution where you're meeting some sort of need. Or the workplace, you go there to get a paycheck to pay for your bills, um, other kinds of larger groups that you're a part of that have more material or instrumental needs. Now there's always exceptions to this, but there does tend to be more that smaller primary groups meet their socio-emotional needs, where larger secondary groups tend to meet more of those material types of needs. Now we also talk about in-group versus out-group. In-group tends to be the people that you feel like you're on the team with, the people who are part of your family, part of your tribe, part of your group, versus the out-group, the people who are sort of on the outside. And we tend to treat these people differently. Now this gets a little bit into social psychology where there's some biases in how we treat people who are in-groups versus out-groups, but we tend to treat in-groups more favorably, the people we see as part of our group, than those who are outside. Now this comes into play with a lot of other things when we start talking about social class, politics, race, ethnicity. There's a lot of areas where in-groups and out-groups come into play. Now the last thing I'm gonna talk about is how group size affects the dynamics of the group. Now I already mentioned one of these. Remember when I talked about socio-emotional needs versus instrumental needs? Well, smaller groups do tend to be more likely to meet those socio-emotional needs or relationship needs, whereas large groups are more likely to meet instrumental needs. But there's some other ways in which group size affects the dynamics of the group. It affects whether or not they tend to be more formal or informal. It tends to affect their stability as a group and also whether or not there are subgroups or cliques. Now let me go over those points. In terms of formal or informal, smaller groups tend to be more informal where larger groups tend to be more formal. 
And in many ways, this is just a function of time and relationships and the ability of humans to get to know people. If you're in a group with 150 people, it takes a lot of time to get to know everyone well. So in that larger group, we tend to be more formal because formal ways of interacting tend to be how we interact with people we don't know as well. We tend to revert to being more polite and more formal. Yes, sir, no, sir, nice to meet you. But in small groups, we tend to have more time to get to know each other better. And the better you get to know someone, the more likely you are to be more informal. Nicknames, just saying hey, being really kind of friendly. So small groups tend to be more informal simply because we tend to know each other better. We have more time to get to know everyone because there might be only five or six people in that group. But larger groups with dozens of people, there's just not enough time to get to know everyone really well unless you've been with that group for a long time. So we tend to be more formal. Now size also affects the stability of a group. But when we talk about stability, we are talking about something very specific. We're talking about the likelihood that the group continues to exist over time. Larger groups tend to be more stable. They can survive more attrition. They can survive more people leaving the group and still remain as a group. If you have a church of 300 people and 12 families leave, and that might be 50 or 100 people, sure, that impacts that organization, but there's still enough people that it tends to continue to exist. But if you have a friendship group of three people and two of them move away, all of a sudden that group can potentially dissolve. So larger groups, tend to be more stable because they can survive more people leaving than smaller groups can. And finally, larger groups are more likely to have subgroups or cliques, and this should seem intuitive. When you are in spaces with large groups, you tend to find that small pocket of people you're comfortable with. And really, in many ways, that's meeting that need of in that larger space with those larger groups, finding that collection of people we can feel close to and comfortable with that help us have those relational needs met while in the midst of a larger group. There's a lot more you can look at with group dynamics, but I think I've covered a number of things that will be helpful for you. Uh, again, I'm Dr. Joseph Camo with Georgia Southwestern State University, and please be sure to click like and subscribe.